What is going on, folks? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pit Podcast. We're continuing the Pit football spring practice theme. We'll talk about some running backs, wide receivers, a little bit of defense action. Today, we're going to hit a whole team with Dalton Capola from the Pit News. All of it's coming up today on Locked On Pit. <laughs> You are Locked On Pit, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Locked On Pit Podcast. As always, thank you for making the Locked On Pit Podcast your first listen every day. I'm Nick Fairbaugh, and folks, I welcome in my good friend and pal, Dalton Capola from the Pit News. Dalton, man, good to have you on, brother. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you got me down here in Florida for spring break. Great bra- backdrop for uh, some <laughs> pit talk down there in Florida, of course, Dalton. And uh, this is a this is an interesting topic to talk about. You're off. The Pit football players are off. I think we're all off right now, spring break-wise. And just chilling, man. Are you decompressing well? Yeah, I'm doing all right. You know, going. I'm staying down with my grandparents, going to the pool, going to the beach a little bit. It doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, still, still doing my tweeting about Kenny Pickett's uh, draft stock. But you know, yeah, getting a nice little break in. Well, you missed the uh, snow up in Pittsburgh uh, yesterday, so certainly much better than <laughs> than people over there are doing right now. But Dalton, I wanted to get your immediate take on. Kind of the quarterback situation. I, I talked about it yesterday. I think that this quarterback battle between Slovis and Patty, while I think Slovis certainly has the front leg and certainly was brought in to start, I don't necessarily think that he's 100% going to be given this job if Patty beats him out and showcases what he could in the spring and Slovis falters a little bit. I mean, what's your take on it? What do you see from Slovis and what do you see from Patty during your days there at spring practice? No, I, I definitely agree with, with what you're saying. I think it's more of a battle than people are, than people realize. I don't think the job is Slovis's uh, immediately. I think he has to earn that. Um, but, you know, obviously, just the first couple of days of spring practice, you take what you see with a grain of salt. You know, those guys, they're just getting into the swing of it. Uh, Keaton's obviously getting used to that new receiver room. Um, but when you're talking to Narduzzi and you're talking to all these players, whenever you bring up the quarterback battle, Every single time they, if you ask a question about Keaton, each player will always qualify it with Nick looks great too. Narduzzi will say Nick looks great too. So I think, I really do think that Keaton's got to win this job. Yeah, that's the vibe I felt. I think that if Keaton Slovis doesn't come and play up to his standards and, and what he could play with, I think Nick Patty's there and he's certainly competent enough. And I, I again, I think the issue is maybe he doesn't have the high ceiling that Pat Narduzzi is looking for with his team. Slovis does, but. If Slovis is going to tank this team, I, I don't think that Slovis is going to play, especially when you have the steadiness you could have with Nick Patty. But I did want to, because I talked about that all yesterday and stuff, but I did want to hit on a few other areas. And first of all, I did want to hit on some of the running backs, because I, this is a running back room that's returning just about everybody uh, in terms of major contributors. They're returning Rodney Hammond, they're returning Vincent Davis, they're returning Israel Abandi Kanda. Now, they're not returning guys like Todd Sibley, but the depth issue is it's something that could be that could arise if they get a few injuries here. But they have three really quality backs right now. When you look at it coming into this year, how is this rotation going to work out? And how has it worked out so far this spring? What, what's coming on with Izzy? Uh, do you think Izzy's going to be the starting workhorse? Do you think it's more so going to be Vincent Davis, just like it was last year? Do you think Hammond's going to step up and take a bigger role? How do you see it work between these three talented backs? Yeah, I mean, I think you gotta you gotta assume Izzy's going to be the workhorse coming up this year. I think I think Signetti's going to you know I think he'll work out um, he'll work out that rotation a little bit differently than Whipple did. Um, I don't think he's as tied to Vincent Davis as Whipple was. Um, you know, obviously Vincent Davis his the thing he does best is uh, pass pro. Um, so, you know, you have that there. But, so he'll obviously still get some time just for what he gives you in the pass game. But, you know, I think – and I do think Roddy Ham is going to take a much bigger role um, in this offense. I think he's he's just like a bowling ball when he gets running with the ball, man. I love the way Roddy Ham runs the ball. 
Yeah, I think it's hard not to love the way Roddy Heaven runs the football. And for a freshman, he's always been a guy that plays with some type of fire. You just don't usually see it. He plays with the maturity to him. I think that's really impressive. And I will say that. And I think Fitz Davis is a good scat back. I think he's a guy, if you get him in space, he can make things happen. I don't think he's as bad as people think he is. But I agree. I think that you're going to see as he just take up more of a role. I think the biggest thing with Izzy is he's going to have to stay healthy and he's going to have to improve in pass protection. I think that's what you said. So is that kind of what you're seeing so far as well? Is he taking a step forward? And, and then overall, have you seen, and I know it's spring, have you seen Izzy work on that pass pro to a degree where you think it's going to be enough to, to really get him maybe 60% of the snaps versus, say, 40% of the snaps? You know, it's funny. What they let us see in practice, Narduzzi keeps his team so under wraps. We don't we have no idea who they they let us, they pretty much let us watch them stretch and run run a couple. Um they run some patterns for us and then they send us out and then we have to kind of deduce from what Narduzzi tells us. But he's he's said that he's made some strides. I think he's he's happy with where Izzy's going because if you remember from last spring, he Narduzzi wasn't thrilled with how Narduzzi or how Izzy came out of out of camp so I think he's happier in the play with the place that Izzy is now so I'm, I'm gonna say yes I think that Izzy will still be the, that workhorse and I think he will get better in pass pro yeah I just think it's so huge for Izzy because again I think this guy is good enough to be an NFL running back so if he can improve on that pass pro we'll see but I think he he can really open up the floodgates here this is a big year for Izzy and Benny Canada because if he can hit the, the stride, I think he can. We're talking about an all-ACC player here. Uh, I really, truly believe he's that talent level. Um, but let's move off the running backs a little bit. Let's go to the wide receivers. And I don't need to ask you anything about Bolitnikoff Award winner Jordan Addison, but I do have to ask you about Pitt's newest wide receiver, Kanata Mumfield. Theoretically, the wide receiver, too, as well with Jared Wayne being the three. First impressions of Kanata Mumfield. What are you seeing with him? He's got he's got really good feet. He's got he can really run some nice routes. I mean, he just watching him move. He's really smooth, really clean with his uh, releases. I was I was really impressed from what I saw from him. And you could tell he'd been working with the quarterbacks to work down that timing. He was didn't really miss a beat. Uh, fits right in with everyone else. And I mean, Jared Wayne's a very talented receiver. And I think those two are going to be you know. They're both going to be vying for that wide receiver two spot. But I think if you wanted to, you could move Mumfield into the slot and leave Jared Wayne on the outside. And I think that would be a really nice combination for whoever's playing quarterback. Yeah, and I always thought that's that's kind of the thing with Kanata Mumfield is looking at what he brings to the table. Phenomenal routes. He runs his routes in a way where few guys do it. And he separates with an ease. So good to hear that that's translating over the field and, and in-person stuff as well. Now, when you talk about Wayne, Mumpfield, and then Addison, obviously those are your top three. Behind them, there's a few more questions, but still deep. It's Jane Bradley. There's obviously Barden as well. There's guys like Miles Alston. There's Addison Copeland. Is there anyone stepping into the vacuum, if you will, to maybe grab that fourth and fifth spot? Or do you think this is Barden, Bradley, and then the rest? I think it's Barton Bradley and the rest. I don't really necessarily see – I don't necessarily see Copeland stepping up uh, this year. Um, I think it's – I think it's – I do think it's Bradley and, um, like you said, why am I drawing a blank here? <laughs> um, yeah, Barton. Barton. Yeah, I do think it's their jobs to uh, – their jobs to lose. Um, and, I do, like you said, the depth at wide receiver is just absolutely – phenomenal so they're they're pretty set in that room and I think Taekwon Underwood's doing a really nice job with them yeah we'll talk a little bit more about some of the new coaches coming in here uh Signetti and Underwood and what you're seeing so far from them but first let me let you guys let you know about Bill Bar because folks I know the New Year's resolutions around this time of year are waiting for you guys, but I'm telling you, because of Built Bar, it doesn't have to be a chore. Have you tried the Puffs? Because if you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best-tasting bars. Puffs are the first-ever protein-infused marshmallow. They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar. They're a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. And, folks, all the Built Bars, including the Puffs, are covered in 100% real chocolate. So you can replace your candy bars with these Built Bars. And here's the thing. You get low in calories, low in sugar, low in carbs, high in protein. Built Bars 
are more healthy than candy bars while also having the taste that protein bars do not have. So, folks, all you have to do is go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Use the promo code LOCK15 for 50% off at Built.com. All righty, folks, welcome back to the Locked on Pit podcast as we are continuing to talk through some pit spring practice things here. Dalton Coppola from the Pit News. And Dalton, when you look at a guy like Tyquan Underwood and, and what he his practice style and his teaching style is, what have you seen from him so far? Is he more of an aggressive guy? Is he more of a, a softer type of teacher way through it? it how's his teaching style been on the field and how do you think these guys in the locker room so far are receptive to him well it's funny you know we when we they introduced him to us he seemed like a really really soft guy you know I don't know if you heard the story how he he gets every guy's phone number to uh so he can get them a birthday cake on their birthday he gets their phone number on their birthday so I'm like this guy's I kind of thought you know he's a little, little bit of a softy either way works out but when I got to spring practice he was on his guys like yelling screaming when they weren't running their routes the right way so I guess I mean off the field maybe he's a little bit softer and he's got it builds that relationship with those guys that way but when they're on the field he's intense he's uh and it was good to see you know it was he was fine-tuning the little details and it was very minute things that he was getting upset about so I, I think he's gonna he's really gonna make sure those guys are getting the work done it's always good to hear I think that's the coaching style that oftentimes doesn't come up. I think usually a lot of coaches follow kind of through their principles. Now, obviously Underwood's from a background where he's played with guys that under Bill Belichick, certainly he's taken some tips and pointers from guys that he's coached with and, and certainly worked under as an NFL player. So it's good to see. And, and certainly I think Underwood's a guy that, coming in with that style is going to get the most out of this team. And they need to be losing Brandon Marion is going to be a big loss. So we'll see if, if Underwood can keep it up already getting it up on the recruiting trail. Now contrast that to a guy like Frank Signetti, who now coming at the offense coordinator, how hands-on has he been with the players? Is he working with specific groups or is he more watching it from afar? What have you seen from Frank Signetti and what's your first impressions of him as a person in his style? Yeah, you know, I think he's um, he's been pretty hands on from what I I've seen. He's been very uh, he's been working a lot with the quarterback, uh, staying with the quarterbacks a lot, um, which I think was kind of assumed, you know, with his background in the NFL and what he's done so far. But um, yeah, he's very hands on, very detail oriented, and I think the thing with him is he's going to work around his personnel. He's not tied to an, a specific uh, style of offense, um, and I think you taught you talked to some players from BC at the combine and they're saying something similar, you know, they noticed that zone runs would be their strength and that's, so that's what they did. So I think you're going to see a lot of that at, uh, here at Pitt now when he's coming from BC. Yeah, that, that is exactly kind of the message I got about Signetti at the combine is that this is a guy that's going to change up his scheme to what he thinks is best, whether that's 12 personnel, whether that's more spread offense. I, I know what Jerkovic and Zay Flowers in 2019, they really were throwing the ball deep because that's what they did well with Hunter Long, and they had that talent level. And then when you looked at this past year, and they lost Phil Jerkovic, and he was hurt, they went to more run heavy, and they tried to kind of exploit the weaknesses of their offense and make them strengths. And, and so I, I thought that they fit nicely to personnel, and I always thought that's something about Frank Signetti. So we'll see kind of what they do here. I don't know what you do here. I mean, you have the talented running backs. You have a pretty veteran offensive line. You have very good receivers. And then you have quarterbacks that you would hope can work through it, two veteran quarterbacks. So it's going to be a tough one. He could really do whatever the heck he wants if he wants to do it. Um, what style do you think they move towards? Do you think it's more zone runs? Do you think it's more 12 personnel? Do you think it's a little mix of everything? I mean, where where's this scheme moving towards under Frank Zignetti? Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see them move towards some zone runs, but I also I also think he's gonna he's gonna use Gavin Bartholomew to the best of his ability because I think you've got an absolute beast of a tight end in a sophomore, Gavin Bartholomew, and I think you need to I think you need to get the most out of him while he's still here because I think he's going to the draft after his junior season. So and Signetti's always done done well with tight ends. I I mean, like you said, Hunter Long, uh Nick Bynum, 
um, back in the day with Pitt. I mean, I think Gavin Bartholomew is going to have a huge role in this offense, and I think he's the I think he's the biggest winner of Signetti getting this job. Yeah, I agree. I think he's been a big winner of this because he can work in that traditional H back really did last year, but also work as a traditional tight end and work in a lot of different roles, showcases, route tree, inline block, lead block, wham, do all these kind of different things. I think it's going to be really good for Gavin Bartholomew. And the question now becomes, and this has been one of the bigger questions of this entire season, beside linebacker and maybe depth at cornerback, the question is, who's the second tight end? Is it, you know, Cole Mitchell? Is it Jake Renda? Uh, is it Kmar Mims? Is it Kai Wright? Who do you expect that to be? And do you expect to see as many two tight end sets? Obviously, we saw a ton of them last year with Kroll and Bartholomew. Maybe they don't have the second guy to run as much 12 personnel this year, but if they want to, who's going to be the second guy to step up? Um, You know, it's a tough one. I think I think Jake Renda could get some time. There's, not, I mean, Trevor Faulkner, um, redshirt freshman. I think he's uh coming in, and I think he could have a big role. He's a big dude. I mean, you put him right next to Bartholomew. The only difference is their number. They're both some big. They're big dudes, and I think he's athletic. I think he could see some time too, for sure. Yeah, and I think it's a tough question to ask at this point in the season. Kai Wright's been that guy, but it's been hurt. Um, a lot, and, and then you have kind of young guys like Faulkner and like Renda and Mitchell that could potentially slot in there, and, and I think it's a, an interesting question. Now, do you think, as as you sit here today, they've talked to some transfer tight ends. They've talked to Steven Solanas from Lafayette. They've talked to a guy that could maybe come in. I don't think they're looking to add right now with, their, with them still being up against the scholarship limit. But is do you think it's possible they look outside to the portal maybe in the spring and try to add someone here? I wouldn't rule it out of the question, no. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's some guys in the portal that you could you could look at, but um, to put yourself like you said, they're up against that scholarship limit, so I think it's re- relatively unlikely unless they think that person can come in and be a true uh, tight end too. So I mean, like. Like you said, they're up against that scholarship limit. So as of right now, I'd say it's more unlikely than likely that they bring in another transfer. All right. Now I want to talk about a few standouts that Dalton specifically saw while he was at practice. But first, guys, let me let you know about Bet Online because it is that time of year again as college basketball's tournament is finally upon us. And from all the latest odds, contests, and players' props, BetOnline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline continues to for all your sporting wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, folks, welcome back here to the Locked On Pit podcast after a short break. Dalton Capola here. Dalton, I wanted to throw this out to you. Name me some guys that you saw that stood out to you immediately when you were watching spring practice this far. Standouts, guys that caught your attention, whether it's offense or defense. Who's Who are some guys that you saw stand out that you might be really excited about? Well, I'll start on defense, and I think the guy that you that really excited me was Servassier Dennis. Not only, We know what he can do as a player. We saw how athletic he is and how smart he is as, at the linebacker's position. Um, but I, I felt like he was taking a more vocal role with his position group. I felt like he was stepping up as the true leader because as you like, he's been the younger guy in that room for a couple of years now. And now, you know, he's, he's really been there, there the longest of anyone in that room. So I think he, and he's leading, uh, Shane Simon from Notre Dame. He's grooming him. He's got, you know, Kamara coming up and Brandon George. I think he's, I think he's going to play a bigger role as a captain in that regard. Yeah, well, I think Sebastian Dennis is a guy that has to step up in that regard as well. As you said, really the only experienced guy, they pretty much lost everybody they had. And Patricia and Bright transfers to Washington. Campbell graduates. Pine graduates. They lose four of their top six, so now it's really just Sebastian Dennis and Brandon George. And they have Shane Simon now, of course. How? What do you see from Shane Simon? I, I know he's a highly pedigree guy from Notre Dame, but – do you think this is a guy that's going to step in and play well at the money? And is he working at the money or is he working more at the star? I know that they said he's going to be a money backer, but is he still working at the money? 
Um, yeah, from what I've seen, it, it, he's at the money. Um, and he's a big dude. Uh, you know, he's athletic and very cerebral. I think that's the biggest thing you're looking for at that position. Um, the line, your linebackers have to be smart players, and they got to be able to control the defense. Um, you know, they always they always say with that this defense, the it comes from the top down. Um, so yeah, I think Shane Simon's gonna. I think he will end up winning that that money position. Um, I don't think they would have brought him in for Notre Dame if they didn't expect him to come in and start. Um, so, and I mean another guy at linebacker that Solomon DeShields, he might get some he might get some time too. I think he's gonna he's He's fighting for some time there. All right. So if you're going to go with the starters, it's going to be Dennis. Simon, who starts at the star? Uh, it's a tough, it's a toughie to right as of right now. If I had to, if I had to give a prediction, I would say uh Bengali Kamara. That'd be an interesting one. Out there. Yeah. I, I think Bengali Kamara would be an interesting one because I'm not sure he's a complete natural fit there. I think the star position mm-hmm. might be one where they're trying to look to add. I know they put an offer yeah. out to Vanderbilt linebacker transfer for Durkee Wright a few weeks ago. Um, we'll see where that progresses, but it's in it's a position where I think if the right guy comes along, they might add to it. Um, do you think that they have enough depth at the linebacker position right now? Uh, you know, I think they have they have depth. I don't know how great the depth is. Um, you know. We haven't seen much from any of the guys in this room. Like, Servasier Dennis is really the only play. Even Shane Simon, he didn't play very much at Notre Dame. Um, very inexperienced group. Uh, I wish they had another guy with some experience to play linebacker because that's a that's a position where you learn with experience, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, this could be a rough start to the year for these guys. They don't have an easy start to the year either. It's going to be West Virginia, no. Tennessee right away. We'll see how this linebacker group can step up. Really going to be a big offseason and test for Coach Ryan Manilek, who's still only in his second year here at Pitt. Now, get, let's go to offense. Standout you saw that really caught your eye, that you are kind of really impressed with, that you saw from the first few days of practice. I'm going to say, I'm going to go back to him, tight end Gavin Bartholomew. He looks a little bit bigger. He looks, and he's also taking a little bit more of a vocal local role obviously because I think it's it's relatively assumed that he's tight end one I don't really think that that's that's a secret necessarily on that team um he looks like he's been in the weight room he's been leading these guys he's been taking these younger tight ends and you know I think he's really he's leading by example and I think that and his hands look good I didn't see him drop a pass this entire time uh you know I think I think Gavin Bartholomew's gonna have a huge year yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I get a bigger, faster, stronger Devin Bartholomew seems like it's not possible, <laughs> but that's scary, um, to say the least, for opposing defenses. And again, Frank Signetti turned Doran Dickerson into a from a fullback into a guy with four four speed that had a thousand yards as a tight end, and he got drafted. So well, there's a history of this guy turning his weapons into cyborgs. Not that Bartholomew was underutilized last year for a freshman tight end, but there's a history of Frank Signetti doing this and, and turning his guys into something special at the tight end position. They're productive in this offense. It's a tight end friendly offense. So I agree. I think Gavin Bartholomew is going to have a big year. All right. So first viewings, let, let me just go back to Keaton Slovis. First viewings. what do you think of it? How does the ball come out of his hand? Does he look composed? Do you like his mechanics? Does his motion look smooth? His chemistry already there. Does it look like they've been together? What's the first impression of Keith Slovis on the field as a live viewing? Yeah, I mean, as you said, I mean, the ball comes out of his hand really well. Um, you can tell he's been working with those guys. The timing's pretty, pretty seamless. Um, throwing motion looks good. From what I saw, I mean, we didn't get to see too much of what he was doing. They're keep, like I said, they're keeping so much of this under wraps. But uh, from what I saw, just right, I didn't. We didn't actually get to see him throw against a live defense, so can't really give you too much on his judgment and his decision making but um ball's coming out of his hand well and he's got he's got the timing down with the receivers and I think at this point of spring ball that's really all you can ask for yeah I agree and I think that we'll find out more with the spring game and again not really till the season it's going to be tough to it's kind of tough to simulate going through progressions and I think that's always been an issue for Keaton Slovis and again I, I worry a little bit about the offensive line and 
maybe, I think that's the, the last topic we're going to talk about here is the offensive line because this offensive line can go through a lot of change. And I know people are going to say no because they brought back every single member of it. Um, so Warren's back, Hoy's back, Drexel's back, Miner's back, Cradle's back. They're all back. But so is Gonsalves, so is Ubovich. Well, there's still young guys like Branson Taylor and Terrence Moore. There's Ryan Jacoby. There's a lot of guys that can come in and shake yeah. up the starting job. How's this lineup going to work out? Because I, I know it's easy to say they just keep the same five, but I think the more you know, I hear, the more I, I think about it, I think there's going to be a shakeup to this unit. Now, I think a guy you mentioned towards the end, Ryan Jacoby, I think that's a guy. He's a he's a he's a mountain of a human. I mean, that guy can move people, and I think. I think the reason he didn't play a lot last year wasn't because of his ability more, but more because that offensive line had been playing together all season long and they had their pulls down, they had their calls set. Um, not that Jacoby couldn't have come in and figured all that out, but I think that Narduzzi was just kind of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But now I think it's a new team, it's a new OC. I think that they take a look at Ryan Jacoby at one of those guard spots. That's That'd be an interesting one because – my thought process is if that happens, you can't really put him over Marcus Minor because he's no. just a tall player. You can't really put him over Jeff Cradle. But the center spot has been a question. With Owen Drexel essentially getting benched last year towards the end with the snapping issues. With Blake Zubo, which playing well but not great, my thought has always been maybe you move Jake Cradle to center and then slot Jacoby in right next to him. Minor on the other side, Hoy right tackle. Warren left tackle. I think Warren, I think Warren Miner and Cradle are the guys I feel good about starting. Hoy, yeah. I think will start whether it's a guard or tackle, but a guy like Gonsalves could come up behind him and maybe take that spot. And then I again, I'm not certain about Owen Drexel returning to the starting lineup there. He had a rough end of the year, and and again, I, I think there's a possibility you move Cradle to center and maybe you slide Hoy in, maybe you put Zabovich there, maybe you put Jacoby there. I think there's going to be a battle for one of those guard spots along with a tackle spot. It's going to be a really interesting one, but I think that this offensive line is a veteran one, and they have so much depth that they should end up being pretty solid, Dalton. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be a good offensive line. I'm not worried about it. I do think there could be some shakeup, but um, I think offensive line is the, one of their strongest position groups going into the season for sure. All right, Dalton. Thanks for being on, man. Tell them where they can find your work, follow you, do all that great stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Nick. Um, you can find my work at uh, – pitnews.com and follow me on twitter at dalton underscore polar all right folks as always thanks for listening and as i ended as always hail to pit